Well, good morning again, and, and welcome to Cornerstone Baptist Church. Would you turn with me to the book of Revelation? The book of Revelation, as you're turning there, I'm going to begin, but uh, find your place in Revelation chapter 3. We've been talking about uh, danger, and we've had this series we began two weeks ago called Danger Ahead. And we've just simply wanted to, to make sure that we are aware of any dangers in our lives as believers and also in our lives as a church. And so we've, we've started this series, and we've talked about the first week, we talked about the tongue, the danger of the tongue, and the devastation, the destruction that the tongue can have. We talked uh, last week about legalism and what legalism can do to the believer's life and what it can do to a church, how it can kill and destroy. And this week we're going to talk about something a little bit different, but before I get into the message, I, as I prepared for this message, I thought about a few things, and one of the things I thought about was Halloween. I love Halloween. I, pastor shouldn't say that, right? That's a no-no. You're not allowed to like Halloween if you're a pastor because, you know, there's, Halloween's is goblins and, and, and ghosts and all those things that a pastor shouldn't associate with, but I don't know why. When I grew up, I just loved Halloween. It was probably the candy. I still love the candy. Um, it, it's just a fun holiday. Uh, I think if, it, if it's in, put in its proper context, you know, it can, it can be okay in some respects, but I thought about Halloween and and as I re read Revelation uh, chapter 3 and, and the, the sermon, as I began to prepare, Halloween came to mind. I thought about uh, vampires. Um, I thought about how many, how many movies there are now about vampires and werewolves, and, and they're all over the place. I don't know what's going on, but I also saw a lot of movies out there relating to zombies. And I just thought, that, you know, zombies are so weird. I never really understood the concept of a zombie, but as I started to read Revelation, it really made me think of a zombie. And the definition of a zombie is a soulless corpse said to be revived by witchcraft, especially in certain African and Caribbean religions. A zombie is the living dead. And did you know that there was a church of zombies in the Bible? We're going to study it today. Can you imagine... Welcome to First Baptist Church of Zombieland. Everybody walks around going, ugh, ah, brains, right? It's silly in a, in a sense, but in a spiritual sense, that's what we're going to look at today at the Church of Sardis in Revelation chapter 3. If you'll stand with me, I know you just sat down. In honor of God's word, would you stand? Let's read Revelation beginning in chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. We'll read verses 1 through 4. It says in verse 1, To the angel of the church in Sardis write, he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars says this, I know your deeds, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen the things that remain, which were about to die. For I have not found your deeds completed in the sight of my God. So remember what you have received and heard and keep it and repent. Therefore, if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief and you will not know at what hour I will come to you. Verse 4, but you have a few people in Sardis who have not spoiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, again, we come before you. God, we ask that you would just speak to us, Lord, in, in power and might, that your spirit would be upon this place. Lord, I ask that you give me the words to say. Lord, that I would simply speak your message and what you would want to say to us today. I pray, God, that you would just move in this place, that you would just simply reveal yourself to us and your will for our church. God, that your spirit would move mightily and that you would receive all the honor and the glory and the praise. Father, if there's someone here that needs to know you as their savior today, if they need to trust in you and, and believe in you, God, I pray that today would be the day of their salvation. Lord, I pray that our church would become alive and that we would be passionate about you and about your word and about the gospel of Jesus Christ and that we would not be ashamed of it. I pray that you would go before us today, go before the words I speak, and press upon our hearts, help us to remove any distractions that we might be thinking of, and help us to solely focus on you and what you want to say to us. We'll give you all the praise and all the glory. In Christ's name I pray, amen. Y'all may be seated. My message is short, uh, a little shorter today, and all the Lord's people said, oh. I said my message is a little shorter today, and all the Lord's people said, there we go. Yeah, I knew I'd get a good, good response out of that. But Revelation is, a, is an interesting book. And so, so we need to just kind of give us ourselves a context here. He's writing, uh, the Apostle John is writing, and, and he's simply repeating or, or stating what Jesus is talking about, what Jesus is saying. Jesus is speaking to seven churches, and specifically here he's speaking to one church, the church at Sardis. And this church is full of zombies. 
It's full of spiritual zombies, the living dead. And in this passage, the Apostle John gives us basic instructions for revival. Basic instructions for coming back to life, to revive ourselves. The, the word revive uh, simply means, it's Latin, it means to live again, to re receive again a life which has almost expired. A simpler definition is revival means to bring back or make alive that which is dead. That's what John's trying to do here. That's what I want to try and do in my life and the life of our church is bring about revival. And, and in verse 1, we see some things. So let's just look at verse 1 before we get into my main points. He says, To the angel of the church in Sardis, he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, says this. Who is the he here? It's Jesus Christ. So Jesus is speaking here, and he says, Listen, to the angel of the church in Sardis, write this. Now, the angel in the church of Sardis is a pastor. Angel there simply means messenger. So the next time somebody asks you, where do you go to church and who's your pastor, tell them you have an angel for a pastor. And make sure you tell my wife that I'm an angel as well. Obviously not literally. I don't have wings and all that good stuff. I'm not perfect. But it simply means messenger here. And so he, he says that, that this, is, this is what I want you to write to the pastor here at the church of Sardis. He who has the seven spirits, that Jesus, who has the seven spirits, now it's not saying literally seven spirits. If you get some time, Flip over later after service to Isaiah chapter 11. Talks about the seven spirits of, uh, of God and, and how they're before the throne. And it's the spirit of knowledge and the spirit of wisdom and, and those types of things. So don't think of it in seven spirits. It's seven aspects uh, of the Holy Spirit. But then he says in the seven stars. And that's a reference to the pastors of these churches. Each star was a pastor for the church. So also along with telling people you have an angel for a pastor, you can tell them you have a star for a pastor. However you want to phrase it. If you want to put the star first, then the angel. Okay, a little over, a little much. All right. But anyways, it's, it's important to know those things. So he knows what, he's, what we're talking about. He un you understand the context here. But the basic principle here is that the church of Sardis is dead. He says, I know your deeds, that you have a name, that you are alive. But what? But you are dead. To bring back or make alive that which is dead. That's what we're trying to accomplish this morning. The first thing that John tells us and Jesus says to us is, recognize that you're dead you have a name that you're alive but you need to recognize that you are dead spiritually you know the interesting thing about zombies is they don't realize they're dead right they're walking around with that blank stare and the pale face and all that stuff and and they don't even realize that they're dead we watched a movie a couple weeks back it was a zombie movie never watch those type of movies i don't know why i watched this one but but the first thing that struck me is they don't even realize they're dead they're in this zombie state right they're just brain dead they don't understand it and the people at sardis were in a spiritual zombie state they didn't realize they were dead they didn't recognize they were dead they didn't understand that they were spiritually dead but jesus says to them i know your deeds that you have a name that you are alive but you are in fact dead you see they were resting on some some things they were they were resting on some past accomplishments there are no words of commendation for this church no praises. If you look in the book of Revelation, these, chap these first three chapters, some of the other churches, they get, they get complimented. Jesus says, good job at this. I know you do this well. But here in, the book, in, in this chapter, the church of Sardis doesn't get commendation. But there's also no doctrinal problems. There's no heresy like we talked about last week. There's no legalism. There's no opposition. There's no persecution. There's no suffering in this church. There's no involvement uh, uh, inside of the church. Now, they're doing things outside of the church. They're helping in their community. They're a big part of the city. But there's no persecution. There's no suffering. They were simply content. They were simply comfortable. But they were simply dead. And it sounds a lot like churches today, doesn't it? Alive in name, oh, there's the First Baptist Church of so-and-so. Their lights are on, but there's no power. There's no life. The church is dead. Warren Wearsby said this about the city of Sardis and about the church at Sardis. He said it had become a shadow of its former splendor, and the church had become like the city. It was alive in name only. The church at Sardis was dead, yet they didn't even recognize that they were dead. What about the church at Lawrenceville called Cornerstone Baptist Church? Let's be real for a moment. What about our church? Where are we when it comes to being dead or alive? 
Some warning signs of a church that is dying or possibly already dead are these. A church that is dying or already dead when it rests upon its history or past laurels. It's consumed with tradition. The people's lips refuse to sing and give praise to God. There's an, an attitude of excuse. Well, I've been there. I've done that. There's an inward focus. There's an attitude of the good old days, how it used to be. There's a lack of giving. There's a lack of sacrificial giving. There's a lack of persecution and suffering. There's a lack of desire to see the Holy Spirit move in power and might. There's a lack of prayer. There's a lack of care or concern for the lost and for the dying world around them. There's a lack of passion for the Word of God. There's a lack of passion for the people of God. There's a lack of passion for the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, and there's a lack of passion for the glory of Jesus Christ. And my question to our church and to myself today is, are we a dead church? Are we spiritually dead and we don't even know it? It makes me think of the story of Samson. How many of you guys heard about Samson in Sunday school? Okay, most of us know the story of Samson, but I'll just rehash it real quick. Samson uh, is set aside uh, from birth, even before birth. Angel of the Lord comes to Samson's parents, tells them, you're going to have a kid that's going to be different. He's going to be a judge. He's going to be strong. Samson grows up. He's a judge. He's strong. Beats up a lot of Philistines, kills a lot of Philistines. Just a mighty, mighty, mighty man from a physical sense. And what's the key to Samson's strength? His hair, right? I like to picture Samson with Goldilocks hair. I don't know why. It just makes me laugh. Big old broody man with Goldilocks hair. Samson's strength is in his hair, and he meets, he meets a lady. What's her name? Delilah. Delilah. Oh, man. You know, I've been reading Proverbs. Proverbs a day. Stay away from men. <laughs> Most of you guys are married, but men, stay away from Delilah's, okay? Different, different sermon, different topic. We'll, we'll stay away from that. Samson is strong. He, he's, he's beating up Philistines. He's killing Philistines. He's, he's doing things that are right, but he's also living against what God wants him to do in terms of marrying the, uh, the Philistine wives and, and associating with them. So Samson, he, he basically is, is killing all these Philistines, and he meets Delilah, and Delilah, for money that the Philistines promise her, tries to get the secret of Samson's strength, right? Tries to find out. How many times does it happen? Three times she tries to find out. Samson tricks her, says it's cords, it's my hair, but you just braid it and this and that. Gives her all these answers, and finally it says after she just nags and nags and nags and nags and nags on him, he gives up the answer. He says, if you cut my hair, all my strength will be gone and I'll be like a normal man. So what does Delilah do? She has someone come in, snip, snip. Samson wakes up. Philistines are upon you, Samson. And all these men tackle him and they subdue him. And it's an interesting, I said that whole story for this one thing. In Judges chapter 16, verse 20, it says this. Samson, he did not know that the Lord had departed from him. He didn't even know that God was not with him when he woke up. You see, it wasn't his hair. It, it, was, it wasn't his hair that actually gave him the strength. It was his obedience to God. It was God by the power of the Spirit that gave him his strength. But it was just symbolic of, of when Samson disobeyed, that, that he was doing things in his own strength. And he got up and he's like, I can do what I've done before. No problem. Bring it on, Philistines. I'm going to knock you all out. And he didn't even know that the Lord had departed from him. My fear is that our church doesn't even know that the Lord has departed from us. My fear is that sometimes I don't even realize that the Lord has departed from me. I remember hearing a story about a pastor who was preaching a similar message. And, and to get the point across, he, he put a coffin at the base of the altar in, in the church. And, and he opened up the, the coffin there at the base. And, and uh, he said, I, I promise you, our church is dead. The proof of, uh, is in the casket. The remains are in the casket. Come by one by one. And the people didn't believe him. So one by one, they come by and they look in the casket. And inside the bottom of the casket is a mirror. And his point was simple. You say you're alive, but you're dead. You say you love Christ, but you don't. You say there's life and passion for God and the gospel and Jesus Christ, but it's not true. You're spiritually dead. The church at Sardis was spiritually dead, and there are four stages of a life of a church that eventually gets to spiritual death, but it goes a man, a movement, a machine, in a monument. It begins with a man, right? God calls a man and, and he says, I want you to pastor a church and I want you to raise uh, uh, the church up. I want you to bring people together to honor and glorify God and to see people accept Christ. 
And then pretty soon that, that man begins a movement because others come along and they're excited and they're passionate and they have a life about them because they believe in the gospel and they believe in Christ and they're passionate about that. And then it turns into a kind of a machine when it takes that right turn into the direction of programs and things we do as opposed to who we are and who we know. And then lastly, after a long time of the machine, of the programs, of just doing things the way we've always done them, it becomes a monument. And dust settles. And spiritual death happens. I want to be quite honest this morning. I believe our church is dead, if, if not at least dying. I truly believe our, our church in general is dying. And of course, as a pastor, that concerns me, and, and I'm responsible. And I want to admit to you that, that I need to every day make sure that I'm not spiritually dead, that I'm awake, that I'm alive in Christ, that I, I, I treasure him and I treasure the gospel. In verse 2, he says the next principle, he says, wake up. Wake up. In other words, he says, watch out also. A, a good translation here is, is wake up and watch out. Almost like a soldier. You see, Sardis was the capital city of Lydia. And it was built on, a, on an outcrop, a, a mountain that kind of rose up. 1,500 feet above the ground. 1,500 feet above the ground, this big old place. And at the top was the citadel, was where they kind of hunkered down when people attacked them. The interesting thing is that people said this place was impregnable. You're not going to get through this place. So many armies came and were destroyed because of this place, this, this Acropolis that they built this city of Sardis on top of. It was, it was not possible to penetrate. And yet two times in the history of the, of, of the city of Sardis, it was captured. Once was, I believe, in 219 B.C. and once was in 549 B.C. Both times what happened was the, the besieging army uh, came out and, and kind of just watched. And they just looked for weaknesses, and they just took their time. And one time, it was a cool story I heard, they said that the army was, was watching, and, and the king, I believe it was King Cyrus, said, listen, any one of you soldiers that can figure out how to get up there so we can defeat them, I'm going to give you a, a big old chunk of change, all right? It's going to be nice. And so one of, the, one of the soldiers sat and waited. 14 days. On the 14th day, he sees a soldier kind of leaning over, and all of a sudden, the soldier's helmet falls off, goes down to the bottom. The soldier... Goes down, goes back up, revealing the secret door at the bottom, how to get back up and how to get in. And so they send a battalion of special forces into that, uh, into that special secret passageway, and they conquer the city that way. The other time, from what historians can tell, they think the soldiers, they just weren't there. You see, there were three sides that had steep, steep cliffs up this Acropolis, and at the top is the city and, and all those things. And so they were guarded. They thought, nobody can get to us. We're impregnable. Never going to happen. They forgot to guard the only place that had the... It was a tough ramp. It was a tough incline, but it was doable. And they just didn't put any people there. And some, some historians say not only did they put, not put the people there, but maybe if, if at worst case scenario they did put a few soldiers there, they were probably asleep. They just became so complacent, so apathetic, so of the attitude of nobody could ever take this place. Nothing bad's going to happen. Do you know who we are? Do you know what we've done? Do you know we're the richest city in the, in, the, in, in the entire known world? Do you know our king is King Midas? The Midas touch, the guy of gold, everything he touches the gold. Do you know we're the seller of wool and, and we can dye things? And, and they were this, this booming, booming city that just was a, an amazing city at one point. But they had become lulled. They had become apathetic. They had become complacent. And Christ uses these illustrations of their history to point out that the history can fall and your church can fall as well. The church at, city, the church at Sardis can fall as well. They were focused on their past. I love this quote, yesterday is a history, tomorrow's a mystery, today's a gift, that's why they call it the present. Church, we need to live in the present. It's okay to honor the past, but we shouldn't embalm it. We shouldn't lift it up. I heard one, at one point that Cornerstone Baptist Church a, a while back, a few locations back, it, it ran 700. Whoop-de-doo. We're not there anymore. You are here. I'm here. 
Our responsibility is to be spiritually alive, to recognize if we're spiritually dead, and then to do something about it, to wake up, to watch out. He says, strengthen the things that remain in verse 2. He says, wake up and strengthen the things that remain, which were about to die. What little life is left, strengthen that life. Be ready like a good soldier. Don't fall asleep. Don't confuse the, your past successes, the past things that have gone well with the present day. God doesn't just bless you now because of what you've done in the past. No, he requires obedience today. And then in verse 2, he also says at the end, for I have not found your deeds completed in the sight of my God. You see, they were doing things. But we're not even doing things. This church was doing things. But they were doing things for the wrong reason. They were a part of the community. They were respected. People looked on and said, oh yeah, that's the church of Sardis. They helped out with that homeless ministry. But they were missing something. They were missing life. They were missing spiritual life. No persecution, no suffering. Nobody was, was attacking them because of their religious views, because of who they thought Christ was. And he says, wake up, watch out. John is saying, recognize you're the living dead, you're spiritual zombies. Wake up, watch out, your job is not complete, I still have more for you. Strengthen the things that remain. And then he says, in verse number three, so remember what you have received and heard, and keep it and repent. He says, remember what you have seen and heard. First he says, recognize you're dead, then he says, wake up, and now here he says, remember what you have seen and heard. What had they seen and heard? What had they seen and heard? Turn with me. I, I didn't put any scriptures on the screens today, except I think maybe one or two, but turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I want you to see what they had seen and heard. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. When you're there, say amen or whatever you want to say. Brian said amen. Good, good job, Brian. I'm there, so I'll say amen. One by one, here come the amens. It's kind of fun. Amen. I heard one in the back. Nikki, did you say amen? Good job, Nikki. 1 Corinthians 15. This is what they had seen and heard. He said, remember this. 1 Corinthians 15, beginning in verse 3. He says, for I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that what? That Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. And that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. What had they seen and heard? The gospel. The gospel message. They had been given the gospel message that Jesus Christ was crucified for, him, for them. That he was, he was beaten for their transgression. He, he was murdered. He was hung on a cross. He was buried in the grave. And he rose victoriously. The gospel, the good news, that now that at one point they were separated from God. And because of what Christ did, that they now have a relationship with Jesus Christ and a relationship with God that which their sin had, had separated them from. It was the gospel, the good news. They, he, told, he tells them to remember Christ and what he had done. Romans 1.16 says what? For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes. Have we forgotten the gospel? Do we understand the significance of the gospel? I take it for granted. I know I do. But that's the beginning of spiritual death. When we forget what Christ has done for us. He didn't have to. He didn't have to do those things. But because of his great love for us, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Do we believe that message? Do we, do we understand that message? Do we live for that message? Do we live for Jesus Christ? Is he our passion? Is he our glory? Is he our sole focus as a church, as individual believers? Do we understand that it's about Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone? They, had re they needed to remember what they had seen and heard. It was the gospel of Christ. 2 Timothy 3, 5 says, Holding to a form of godliness, all they although they have denied its power, avoid such men as these. We need to stay away from, 
from getting into the thought of, of, well, it's just methods, or it's just programs, or it's just this, or it's just that. If we can just get this people group to our church, then we'll grow. No, it's because of Jesus Christ and what he's done and his power in your life that our church will grow. It's you going into your community. It's me going into my community and telling people the gospel is the good news. Jesus Christ has come to save you, not just from this life, but for eternity. You can have a relationship with God. I am passionate. I'm not doing this. I'm not working myself up just to stir your emotions because I know this. I can sit up here and yell and scream and shout till I'm blue in the face and I pass out if the Spirit of God does not illuminate this in your heart. It's all in vain. And I ask you, believer, wherever you are in life, make Christ your aim. Make Jesus your goal. Make him your first love. The, the church before this was told that they, he didn't have anything against them except this one thing. You've less, left your first love. They left Jesus. They were doing all the churchy things, but they left Jesus behind. Christ says, remember what you have learned, church of Sardis. The church was active for the Lord, but they were not intimate with the Lord. We can do as many programs, and I believe in programs, I believe in methods, I believe in doing the things we need to do to solidify our base. But ultimately, if you and I don't have a relationship with Christ that's on fire on a daily basis, we will die. Period. I can't do it. Mike can't do it. Diane can't do it. Nikki can't do it. No one person can do it. It's got to be the Spirit of God illuminating your heart and you saying yes i choose to remember i choose to remember the gospel the good news i choose to remember what christ has done for me i choose to re remember and recognize that a hundred years from now all my silly little problems are just going to be in the past and that i'm living for the king and his kingdom are we spiritually dead are we a zombie church after he says, remember, he says, keep it. What is he referencing when he says, keep it? Go back to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3, he says, and keep it and repent. Keep it here simply means live like you know the resurrected Christ. Why is it that people separate pastors from normal people? Why do they think you should be spiritual and your priority should be Jesus Christ, but my priority is my family? You should be spiritual. You should be like Jesus Christ. But my priority is my children. You should be like Jesus Christ. Your passion should be for Jesus and for lost souls. But my responsibility is just to live the best life that I can. No. Believer, your responsibility is to love Christ with everything that you have. It's to make him known in other people's lives to, to put him on the throne of your life. To let him have the preeminence. That means first place in your life. If you have trusted in Christ as your Savior, that's your call. That's what you should remember. That Jesus Christ died for your sins. That he was buried and that he was rose, rose again from the dead. And you should be a passion in your heart and in your life to share that with other people. Why are we ashamed of the gospel? What is it? Do we not believe it? Are we so scared of what someone else is going to say? In reality, we, 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 we are faced with is that if we don't tell that person, there's a good chance that they'll never hear or, or they won't know or the Holy Spirit won't work in their life because we didn't share that message and they'll spend eternity away from God. We're so temporal. We get so fascinated with the here and now and the problems of this life and God says, listen, seek ye first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added unto you. Make Jesus your, Jesus your passion, your sole purpose, your life. Lastly, he says in verse 3, after he says keep it, he says and repent. Repent. Now he's told us to recognize that we're dead. Some of us need to start there. He's told us to wake up, to watch out, be ready. He says remember the gospel. The good news of Jesus Christ. We live in a, a lost and dying world. The gospel is the other, only thing. That's where the power comes from. If the gospel bores you, if you care less about Jesus Christ and what he did for you and for others, I, I, can, I can judge and, and say, you know what, that, that might be a sign. That might be an indication you're not a believer. 
Because it doesn't line up with scripture. It doesn't line up with what Christ has said. Now maybe it just means you're backslidden. And even then it means you need to wake up. Wake up. Wake up. I pray, I pray this week that, that the spirit of God would be working in your hearts even before you came to service this week. That you would realize that, that as a church body we need to wake up. Remember what the gospel is and what it means to us. Remember that it's Christ. It's not good works. It's not any other thing but Christ. And then lastly, repent. What does it mean to repent? Repentance is simply a change of mind resulting in a change of behavior. I thought this way about something. I have truth. Now I think this way. My actions reflect now how I think. I thought this way about something. I didn't think Jesus was that important. I thought I could just live my life and be good and go to church on Sundays. I understand now that I'm spiritually dead. I understand now that I need to wake up. I understand now that I need to remember the gospel of Jesus Christ and what he did for me. And I repent. I change my ways. I change my mind. I change who I am. I make Jesus Christ my life. I turn from that. Repentance is changing the mind, resulting in the change of behavior. Some of you need to just change certain sins that, you're, that, that have you entangled. I mean, there's strongholds in your life, but I'm not talking about that type of repentance. I'm not talking about simple repentance about one sin or two sins or this or that. No, I'm talking about repenting in terms of making Christ your king. Making Christ your Lord. Making Christ first in your life. Am I being repetitive? I hope so. This is the most important thing in your spiritual life, in your life. Making Jesus Christ number one. I'm talking about the single sin of neglecting the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ, and neglecting to have a passion for Jesus. I told someone this week, I want to want Jesus. I want to want Jesus. I didn't, I didn't stutter. I want to want Jesus. You see, I don't always want Jesus. But I want God to infuse in me a passion, a, a desire, a longing to want to want Jesus. If you pray that prayer, he will begin to give you that desire. He will begin to give you that passion to know him, to long for him, to make his name known, to see a lost and dying world around us. A passion for the gospel to be preached among the nations and in our community. Folks, we need revival. We're a dead church. If we're not dead, we're, we're dying. It's been a long time coming, and I, and I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but unless something changes, we're going to be completely dead, no pulse, no life, no church. God will come back, judge us, and it'll be over. It's not just on me. It's on you. You are the church. You are the body of Christ. You are called to make Christ king in your life, to remember the gospel. We need the Spirit of God upon this place. As Baptists, we shun that. As Baptists, we, we don't want to talk about the Spirit. The Spirit of God needs to be upon your life, in your daily life, in your daily communication with others. The Spirit of God needs to have His power in your life. Are you allowing it? Are you sleeping? Are you, are you asleep in terms of spirituality? Are you dead? I pray that the Spirit of God would wake in your heart, would wake you up. God, I want His Spirit upon this place. We need revival. We're a church of zombies. Do nothing. Been there, done that, Christians. Recognize we're spiritually dead. Wake up and watch out. Remember the power of the gospel. Remember Jesus Christ and repent. In light of everything I've told you, for goodness sake, repent. Turn from those things you've been doing. Turn from the life of living for yourself. Live for Jesus Christ. Some of you have good intentions for me. I've only been here six months. You want to see the church succeed because you want me to succeed. You want me to succeed because you want the church to succeed. And I appreciate that. I'm thankful for your friendship. I'm thankful for your concern. But that's not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. I'll tell you right now, I'll fall flat on my face. The only thing that's going to change this church and make it alive is the Spirit of God revealed in your life by obedience to Christ. I want to end on a positive note. Verse 4, he says, But you have a few people in Sardis, 
They have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. I counted on my hands this week the number of people I thought were sold out to Jesus Christ in our church. You might say, that's, that's judgmental. I don't know your heart, so I'm sure I missed some people. I'm sure I, I overestimated some people. But generally, just looking, according to Scripture, when a person is on fire for God, as I looked out into our church, as I thought about our members, I came up with less than 10. That's not okay. That's not okay. I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not coming at you in terms of uh, wanting to be a schoolmaster and correct you. I'm coming at you in love because I know that God's word says what's best for us is Christ. What's best for you is Christ, not just for our church, but for your life. It's making Jesus Christ first in your life. And to the few who are dedicated, to the few who are trying, to the few who are, who are still spiritually alive just a little bit, and to the few that are spiritually alive a lot, I want to say thank you. Thank you. Thank you for making Christ your king. Thank you for being passionate about the church. Thank you for the work in the ministry. Thank you for doing the things that, that we couldn't do without you. Thank you for your obedience to Christ. There's still a few here, but our church needs revival. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you again for allowing us to, to hear from your word. God, I don't ever want to get in the way of your word. And I, my passion sometimes, I think, does that. And I, I pray, God, that you would forgive me, that your spirit would simply do the work that only you can do. God, I think you know my heart, and I think you know my desire for this church. And I pray, Father, that you would have your way. Lord, I ask that these people and, and myself would be spiritually awakened, not just today, not just because they heard one message, but every day that they would choose to love you the most. That they would know that Jesus Christ is worth it. That you have called us to recognize that we're dead and to recognize that we need to wake up and then to remember the gospel of Jesus Christ and then, oh God, to repent. To turn from our self-satisfying ways and our self-living ways and to make you king of our lives. I pray that you would do a mighty work in this church and that your spirit would have his will. And God, that we would give you honor and praise and glory for being simply who you are. I ask that you continue to work in our hearts. There's someone here that does not know you today as Savior. Help them to know that you came for them. You died on a cross to take their sin, to take their punishment. You were buried in a grave, Lord, and you rose victor victoriously over death. Help them to know if they simply trust in Jesus Christ and return from their sin, they can have eternal life with God. It's so simple. Pray, God, that you would continue to receive glory and honor in this church and that no matter what, we would be sold out.